in the coming 20 minutes or so, I'll try to convince you that it's not just how you do, but when you do an ablation procedure. This is how we traditionally looked at AFib. We looked at it as paroxysmal and persistent. Keep in mind that these are based on random cutoffs for definitions. The AFib is truly a continuum of, of illness, whereas it is a progressive disease in nature. And it, it, it changes over time from a, an intermittent form to a more persistent form, whereas in early stages, it could be primarily about the triggers, but as you progress over time, it becomes more actually about the substrate, and the, the role of the substrate may become more relevant. And as such, for the purpose of my talk, I'm not going to mention paroxysmal or persistent. I'm just going to use the terminology of uh, less aggressive AFib or more aggressive AFib, less advanced AFib and more advanced AFib, because that, that actually would be a, a better way probably to describe a continuous process than just a random categorical kind of uh, cutoff points. And we know that AFib actually leads to structural and electroanatomical remodeling over time. And this type of uh, mechanism is what leads to the concept of AFib begets AFib. And actually, the more and the longer uh, history you have of AFib, the more structural changes you have. And inherently, it becomes much harder uh, to control. And it is conceptually acceptable, actually reasonable, to believe that maintaining sinus rhythm early in the process may actually slow progression, and there are some data that suggest that it is the case. Whereas the goals of treatment in, in AFib are typically stroke prevention and controlling symptoms by reducing burden or slowing progression, in patients with persistent AFib or advanced stages of AFib, there is actually, there are a lot of data that suggests that a more advanced AFib is associated with worse clinical outcomes, which actually could reflect the underlying substrate. And as such, when we approach patients with early stages of AFib, we can achieve excellent outcomes with ablation, whereas ablation typically for more advanced AFib are typically uh, with suboptimal uh, outcomes, which again could reflect an increasing role of the substrate uh, over time and as such, a, some sort of etiopathy. So timing is important, don't get me wrong, but it's also important how you do an ablation, and how you do an ablation is actually very important. But keep in mind, over the past 15, 20 years, we've done AFib ablation in a lot of ways. Lots of strategies have been proposed, and everybody actually presents data, and at, at the end of the day, everybody's achieving similarly uh, up, actually similar rates uh, or, of su or success. Going from cafes to dominant frequencies to, to rotor ablations, ablation of posterior wall, things like that, but we're still actually not achieving good outcomes and that tells you that we still don't understand AFib. It's important actually how you do it, but regardless how you do it actually, make sure that you're creating good ablation lesions, good contact, good force, uh, enough, enough power to achieve enough depth of lesions and good quality lesions because otherwise you set up yourself for flutters and, and things alike or definitely recurrence. This is how we do it. In our practice, as Dr. Natale mentioned, the posterior wall is part of the, uh, the, the standard set or the standard target for ablation, whereas my, my post-AFib ablation maps look like that regardless of whether the patient is with paroxysmal or persistent, because the, sub, the, the, the posterior wall is, is actually part of the trigger source, and it shares the same embryological origin as the veins. And the way we do it, we don't typically just create lines on top and the bottom, but we kind of like pepper the, the posterior wall with lots of lesions, basically trying to avoid setting ourselves up for uh, recurrent flutters, and achieving more, more debulking of the, the, the substrate uh, or the actual trigger source. It's also important how you do it and making sure that you do it safely. These are some data from the nationwide inpatient sample showing that we've seen an increasing trend of complications, especially, at least in this analysis, related to the fact that AFib are being done more widely 
and the mortality has been associated primarily with patients getting ablation procedures at lower volume centers. And it's a lot concerning that we still hear about 0.2% mortality. That's two patients dying out of every thousand. And I'll show you actually some data. We published our experience between 2000 and 2015. Actually, the death rate from the ablation, we didn't have a single death from any ablation procedure over 10 or 12,000 patients. And the rates of complications from these procedures nationwide is still about 7%. So yes, it's, it's important to know actually how to do it and to make sure that you do it safely. And as I mentioned to you here, actually this is a summary of our experience between 2000 and 2015, showing that at a large tertiary care center with a good uh, quality improvement uh, initiative in place and adoption of new technology, technology, we've seen actually a downtrend in the rates of complications. But we also have a lot of new technology uh, coming up with the hope that we can actually improve the safety, we can do these ablations more effectively, but most importantly, I think the area that we need to work ab actually about with the most is to try to understand AFib better and try to actually improve our ablation strategies to, to differ in, a, in, a, in a more personalized uh, approach. So as I mentioned to you, AFib is a continuum, but it's not just how you do it, but when you do it. And if we take a step back to the approach of this, of this topic, why is, it, why, is it, why is a more advanced stage in AFib history important? What, does, it, does it matter? Does it matter where you are along that spectrum of illness? And the answer is yes, and I'll show you actually some data to support that. More advanced stages in AFib history, more likelihood of adverse clinical events, worse quality of life in symptomatic patients, and Definitely more advanced stage in AFib means poor ablation outcomes. Looking here at more advanced AFib and stroke risk, the more advanced you are on that disease continuum or spectrum, the more likely that you experience a stroke related to your AFib. Along the same lines, we know that AFibs, AFib begets, AFib begets heart failure and vice versa. And actually, this is to a certain degree confounded by the presence of risk factors which highlights the importance of risk factor control as Dr. Sanders discussed earlier. But that said, the symptoms in heart failure primarily correlate with burden. And actually, we know that in patients who have uh, AFib at baseline, the incidence of heart failure actually is more in patients who have more advanced AFib at baseline. The same actually applies to prevalent heart failure or prevalent AFib in patients with heart failure, patients actually um, who have uh, heart failure at baseline, their disease burden in terms of AFib actually was more likely in patients who have more advanced uh, heart failure stages. And some additional data here from uh, the Castle AFib that was led by Dr. Marouche. We know that a more aggressive rhythm control strategy aiming to reduce the burden and actually reduce the AFib or slow its progression with an ablation procedure can prevent death or hospitalization from worsening heart failure, but importantly can improve LV function in patients with heart failure. This is some additional data to show you that actually with more advanced AFib there is increased mortality. So along the same lines for patients who are symptomatic, more, more advanced AFib, more burden equals more symptoms. And this is actually supported also by some findings from uh, the Cabana trial, whereas a more aggressive rhythm control strategy in those patients resulted in significant improvement in the quality of life. And this is our own data and patient, with patient reported outcomes. After an AFib ablation, most patients report some improvement of their quality of life and AFib symptom severity score. And that is actually, that applies to more than 80% or about 90% of patients. But most importantly, and this is the point here, with less burden of AFib over time or less recurrence, there is a more significant improvement in quality of life. So in summary, when it comes down to disease spectrum of AFib stage and disease spectrum and adverse clinical outcomes, I've showed you enough data to actually support the concept that a more advanced AFib is associated with higher stroke risk is associated with higher risk of prevalent and incident heart failure, 
and definitely with lower quality of life in symptomatic patients, and most importantly, AFib begets AFib. So more advanced AFib equals even more advanced AFib. So it's important when you do it and when you try to slow or stop that uh, badness from happening and progressing over time. The question is early ablation associated with better outcome, and I'll share with you some evidence from the literature. These are some data from uh, Dr. Marouche's group uh, back, uh, back actually in 2009 showing here that with more advanced remodeling, more scarring, there are worse clinical outcomes, and of course, uh, highlighted by uh, both Dr. Akum and Dr. Marouche's talks. This is also a population of patients, actually of about 4,500 patients by, uh, by Bunch and his group, showing that early ablations in this, in this uh, cohort was associated with uh, better outcomes in terms of AFib recurrence rates, and that was actually for both short and long-term outcomes. But importantly, early ablation actually was associated with better survival, less hospitalization for heart failure. It didn't have much effect on uh, stroke risk, but for the most part showing less AFib, less heart failure, less mortality. This is another study from Europe, smaller study, but reproducing in, uh, the same findings in a different population, showing that early ablation is associated with better outcomes. In this uh, series, it was one year or less. But these studies so far have included both paroxysmal and persistent, and this is also another study with, more, uh, with both paroxysmal and persistent, a European study showing better outcomes with early ablation. The question is, what about those patients with persistent AFib, those in whom AFib had already progressed from an intermittent and rare form to a more sustained and difficult to treat form? In this, in this series back from 2016, we investigated the time from the onset of persistent AFib, meaning people have been, had been followed for paroxysmal AFib, say, for years, and we looked at the time when their AFib was able to sustain itself for the first time. And then we looked at the time interval between that progression to the persistent form, understanding that this is, this is actually based on random definitions in terms of cutoff for one week or more of AFib or things like that. But that stage of transition from an intermittent form to a more persistent form actually is very critical. And we showed that the longer patients waited between that time, that time of persistent progression to the time they got their ablation, the ablation results actually uh, uh, were better, and those with early interventions were worse with late intervention. The, more, the important findings here, do we have a pointer? <coughs> yeah. We have a big arrow. Yeah, here, so and this, on this screen here, the early interventions, these, these are the typical Kaplan-Meier curves that we see with our, almost our paroxysmal AFib patients. But then here, regardless, and I'll tell you that probably, I mean, there are 20 of us in the group, probably 15 uh, back then, and all of us actually use some different uh, strategies with, you know, subtle differences, but here, in those with late ablations, Regardless, you're not achieving an optimal outcome, whereas early ablation actually is the only curve that separates itself from the rest. And in this uh, cohort, we also showed that the longer you wait uh, from that persistent AFib diagnosis time to the time actually you get your ablation, the more remodeling you have with uh, larger atria, higher levels of CRP, and higher levels of BNP, markers of atrial stretch and uh, inflammation. Importantly, when we investigated in uh, multi, uh, multivariable analyses, the time interval, so we looked at the time interval from the initial diagnosis of AFib, and I'm not talking about persistent AFib, the first time they were diagnosed with any form of AFib ever, and the onset or the time of ablation. That actually had some correlation, but it didn't, it wasn't as robust as the correlation between transitioning, between the time of transitioning to persistent and actual the ablation time. So that's an important concept. It is that transition that marks some process in the natural history of AFib that there are, there are bad things that are gonna happen in, in the future related to this uh, AFib uh, process. In summary, I hope that I gave you enough information and data to show you that more advanced AFib stage 
means worse clinical outcomes. AFib is a progressive disease, and we know that AFib begets AFib, and that cycle needs to be stopped somewhere. And the classification of AFib types actually are based on random cutoffs, and we need to think of AFib as a continuum, as a progressive disease, and most importantly, that early ablation is associated with better outcomes. And I thank you so much for your attendance.